colleague of mine in India, Unmesh Joshi, who's been working on a set of patterns around distributed systems. And I mean, it started out really because he felt that, he, that our folks at Fortworks needed a good grounding in what's going on inside distributed systems that we use all the time. Kafka, Cassandra, all of these systems are out there doing quite a lot of about quite sophisticated distributed work. And even though you're not going to build your own messaging system or database, you often need to know a good sense of how they work because without that, you don't know how to utilize them properly. You don't know how to debug problems. I wouldn't necessarily call it mechanical sympathy because you're not getting down to the hardware level, but you are getting, you do need some sympathy with the underlying platform that you're working with, a kind of platformish sympathy um, to be able to, at you know, times when you need to focus on performance or, or the way that things are operating. Yeah, I so think he so, start. Go ahead. Yep. So sorry, I, was, I, was, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I was I was just going to say I, I I think there are some um, I, I I've characterised the, the the kind of the uh, the distributed computing uh, problem as, as kind of our our version of quant, you know, quantum mechanics. It's you know you take a re a relatively tiny step uh, in, in your software and you're in very deep water quite quickly, quite easily if you're not careful. And yes. so there are some principles that, that matter a lot to be able to you know, guide a design, to be able to cope with the, the, this explosion of complexity that you buy into as soon as you've got bits of software working on more than one computer in more than one. Yeah, platform. exactly. And so he felt that um, our folks in, um, needed to be sort of have a better exposure to that, particularly yeah. we hire a lot of people straight out of college and the like, and they don't have enough background in this. So he started setting up some training work primarily based in, in our, our India um, operation, which is pretty sizable these days. Um, and he contacted me and we developed the idea of trying to pull this first stuff out in terms of patterns, because patterns mm -hmm. are always I, I, the technique that I've found very effective to try and explain different solutions you have to problems and to be able to choose between them and know how they fit in a context with yeah. patterns. You don't get a kind of set, you know, do these 10 steps and you lead to happiness. It's more like yeah. here are 20 things you have to consider and you have to navigate between them and choose trade-offs between them. Yeah. And the way in which that he's developed this is he's gone into the source code of things like Kafka, Cassandra, React, all sorts of distributed systems, you know, lots of different languages and figured out exactly how they handle coming up to consensus um, mm -hmm. and things of that kind, and then tried to pull the patterns out. And then we've worked together to help describe those patterns. Yeah. So he's been publishing those on my website over the course of the last year, year and a half, perhaps, that we've been putting them out. We've, we've just got another batch that's going into um, some copy editing review Mm -hmm. uh, that go into things like Paxos and some of the replicated log stuff behind Raft and how really complicated two-phase commit can get when you're doing <laughs> yeah. this kind of stuff. Yeah, um, It's some really interesting stuff. The Paxos stuff in particular took quite a bit of mental effort to um, figure out how to understand it, let alone explain it. Yeah. Um, and this, I, I expect, will turn into a book. Um, we haven't sort of lined up publishers or anything yet, but I, I'm not expecting any problems trying to find someone who'd want to pull this thing, thing through it. And that, that's one of them. And that's a very deep technical uh, topic to dive yeah, into. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, uh, it's, it's a topic that I, I find particularly interesting. I, I, I kind of started working on distributed systems a very long time ago. And to some degree, I think that the technologies have made the problems more difficult because it used to be harder to do it. <laughs> it used to be harder mm. to, to get you to, to begin to start to remote, make, you know, interact with things remotely. Now it's so easy and the tooling is so good that makes this a small step that's almost invisible, but you're still buying into all of this complexity. That I, I, I wondered whether, you know, that's an aspect of, of this that, um, I, I, I'm certainly not saying that people today are less smart than people a long time ago. It's just that you, a long time ago, you were, you, you, were, you were just more exposed to the problem earlier on in the process of making, the, you know, making that step, I think. Yeah, and I mean, I've always argued that the last thing you want is that you want to avoid distribution as much as possible. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, it is absolutely. such a complexity booster. So yeah. if you can avoid building a distributed system, avoid it, please, yeah. because it's going to yeah. make your life yeah. so much easier if you can yeah. avoid distribution, just like concurrency. You can avoid yeah. concurrency, do so, yeah. please, because yeah. it's going to make things so much better. 
but yeah. there are times you cannot or you know Indeed. you're building on top of something that's got this distributed substrate on it and it's going to do weird things to you if you don't understand what's going on and you just have to deal with it and so this is a way of at least trying to visualize and explain some of those underlying things that are going on so that when weird things happen you know why yeah it's, it's one of the things that i i, I think is kind of interesting is that the you know, problematic as it was for in some other circumstances the relational database model of you know the the three-tier architecture kind of system that we that we all built uh, relational databases gave us a model for synchronizing changes that we didn't have to worry about too much when, when programming against them because they looked after part of the problem with you know in the scope of a transaction and stuff like that and as soon as you start doing this with technologies that are not it gets a bit scary. I, I did some consultancy for a client who I shan't, shan't name, which is a very large development, and they were using a, a non-SQL data store that didn't have any transactional integrity. And so I, you know, I kind of looked at this, and it made me as nervous as hell because, mm. um, as far as I could see, it was just look of the draw, what, what the state of this system ended up being, depending on you know, which, which, which record landed first. There, there was no management of the concurrency in this system because people weren't thinking about these sorts of things. So it seems important to be able to worry about these sorts of principles and so on. Yeah, and I mean, transactions, even with a single database, are not necessarily uh, just a simple solution because no, no. you can't hold a transaction open for, for as long as you need to. So Indeed. you have, have to work around that. And that, that's something we got involved in with a Patents of Enterprise Application Architecture book that I wrote 20 yeah. years ago. And Dave Rice sat down and worked through and explained some of the patterns that you need to deal with so that you can handle that kind of stuff what we yeah. referred to as business transactions that you could keep open for quite a long time in order for people to do their work, but at the same time resolve them against the system transactions that need to be open for a short time because you don't want to hold a, a system transaction open for very long because it leads to uh, things being blocked. Absolutely. So even transactions, I mean, they certainly help because you need that ability to be able to update yeah. five things and know that it's becoming it's atomic, but yeah um you still have to work around it even in a in a single processor system when we move into a distributed system then there's a whole bunch of things because now you haven't got one clear source or at least you can easily get yourself into a situation where you haven't got one clear source and of yeah. course often the solution is to say one node has to be the leader and yes. you have to talk to the leader and then the leader will ensure that the followers mm -hmm. match that but then, of course, how do you have a leader? What happens when the leader goes down? All that kind of stuff comes into play. And that's that's when distributed consensus protocols like Paxos and Raft come into come into play. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's that's part of that thing. And so it's just been very interesting to dig into that. And I'm glad it's somebody else who's going through all this source code to figure out how <laughs> these open source systems do this. Um, yeah. in, rather than me. And he and, and he's building it. He's doing it the way I would do it, which is, well, I don't quite. I need to understand what's going on. So let's build my own simple implementation just so that I can illustrate the key point. Yeah. I'm referring back to the real thing and looking, comparing it to this and using that back and forth. And then using, of course, those code examples uh, to help illustrate and explain um, in the book material. And I, 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 I always think that's one of the, the interesting parts of, uh, of writing or, or publishing ideas to, to try and help people better understand them is that the difference between it, it's no good just showing somebody an enterprise system because it's too mess, messy and complicated to be able to see the yes. wood for the trees and so being able to synthesize examples and descriptions that can be realistic enough to demonstrate a concept without being realistic enough to hide the concept <laughs> yeah and that that is one of the challenges of coming up with examples of course you yeah know, yeah something that's it's always going to be toy because you can't make it real because as you say if it's realistic enough then you're not going to be able to understand it but yeah. at the same time you've got to ca catch the core of the problem and and yeah. coming up yeah. with good example design I, I mean i find when in my writing um i mean i have been in the situation with this is a refactoring book where i might spend two days just coming up with an example yeah. And then once I've got the example, the actual prose and the explanation, yeah. I can knock that off in a few hours. But trying to find the right example that just illustrates exactly what I'm after, that 
can be really, really hard. And Unmesh is finding this as well as trying to get the right thing that will show what's going on and not be overwhelmingly complicated. It's, it's a tricky balance to, to grab and it takes a lot of time to come up with them. Indeed, yeah. So, so where, where does this book sit kind of between uh, things like Patterns of Enterprise Architecture and Gregor Hope's book on, um, yeah, on patterns for... Um, I've forgotten the title of his book, but message, uh, message of messaging, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it fits definitely within that family, I would right. say, right. because it, it, I mean, it, it's, yeah, I mean, it, I, I think of it as a similar kind of level if you want to understand how the, the, these core distributed systems that you're building on work to a degree that you can have that appreciation, that sympathy. Right. Um, it's not specifically about how you organize a messaging system, which is what sorry, Gregor's and Bobby's book do, yeah, uh, yeah. does. But um, again, it, it, you, when you're working with something that works in this kind of way, you need that sympathy as to how it's operating under the hood to at least some degree. It, it, it sounds interesting. So, so, so is, it, is, it, is that a book that's kind of nearing completion or is it, is it just starting out? You, you said you've been collecting uh, patterns for a while. We're well into the process. I don't yeah. know that we've really sat down, at, unless she's really sat down and said, this is you know, where we would think the ending boundaries lie. Um, this particular last batch um, mm -hmm. that really looked at uh, consensus algorithms like Paxos, Raft, and um, Two-Phase Commit, um, those took a particularly long amount of time to work through yeah. because they're complicated um, things. Um, so we'll see. At some point, we'll sit down and get a sense of, okay, how far are we with that? Um, but the nice thing is readers can look at it now. I mean, the, the stuff I'm mentioning at the moment isn't out there as, as we speak. It may be by the time um, this is actually uh, made visible. Um, yep. But there is still a lot of stuff here about replicated logs, high watermarks, low watermarks, mm -hmm. um, and things of that kind. That is a good chunk of material that, that's there on the site at the moment. Cool. I, I, what, what, one of the other... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm where you can use it appropriately. I, I, I quite like eventual consistency models as well, and and right. kind of the, the, the match between um, drawing the right kind of seams in your problem domain so that the eventual consistency doesn't trip you up. Uh, and I think right. that's what, that's one of the things that we managed to get reasonably nicely organised with with the LMAX system that, that you wrote right. about on your site a few years ago. Um, yeah. was that you know we could, there were things like we didn't really mind that the order history wouldn't necessarily be perfectly in sync with the, the current order picture as long as each was true was true in the context in which you were going to view it <clears throat> right and then and, and that kind of those kinds of decisions are important because you have to rely on a certain degree of eventual consistency if you're going to get the kind of throughput and res again it's the classic safety versus liveness trade-off yes yeah. i can make a perfectly safe system it just won't do anything <laughs> <laughs> i need it to be alive <laughs> and so you're trading that off all the time it's always yeah. every so everything in terms of concurrent or distributed system because a distributed system is just a form of concurrent system is yeah. a trade-off of safety and liveness i yeah. mean the difference yeah. between a distributed system and a single process concurrent system is um, with at least a single process concurrent system you don't have bits of your system falling it either all <laughs> falls over or none of it does but with a distributed system you know bits and pieces fall off all the time so you've, yeah. you've got to yeah. deal with that um but yeah i, th I think this, i i'm very excited by this work it, I, that uh, unmesh is doing i think he's really sort of doing a good job of, i think it will be a really solid book for people in the future to learn about how distributed systems work in practice cool um, and of course the in practice is kind of important because you do certainly run into some things that are talked about a lot in theory but not used in practice because there are practical gaps in that theory <clears throat> paxos um, <laughs> This clip was taken from my podcast, The Engineering Room with Dave Farley, a monthly podcast with some of the brightest minds in software engineering. You can find full episodes on all your favorite podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Amazon Music. Your support helps us to bring you these regular episodes, so please leave your positive review on your preferred podcast platform to help us to continue to grow and bring you great guests and their insights. Thank you very much for listening.